Dr. Fisk, um, Professor Anne Naim of Emory University in the United States has uh, written uh, that uh, there is a contradiction in terms behind the notion of the Islamic State. He's argued that Islam requires a secular uh, regime. It requires to be taken, you know, uh, to, to the, an end to this concept that you can enforce uh, Sharia. Um, what do you think of that uh, yourself, uh, or have you any opinion on that uh, can, can uh, contribution the, from him? I'm getting an echo back here that you're not hearing. What exactly did prof the professor at Emory say again? Can you just give me the actual phrase he used? Well, he, he, he says that um, the uh, Islamic State is a contradiction in terms. Yes. And that it is impossible to impose Sharia by the state. Yeah. He argues that the uh, concept of the state behind uh, such uh, notions is in fact a European, uh, not a Muslim conception, because he is a devout Muslim himself. Yeah, I mean, I think he's probably right, because if you actually, and I'm not going <laughs> to urge you to read Dabiq again, but if you read Dabiq and look at the pictures, they've got pictures of the river police, the, the ISIS river police in newly green painted boats, you see, which obviously reflect blue and green on the water, uh, who are protecting the fisheries, you see, the state institutions. The latest thing they've been doing is showing the new gold dinar coins of the Islamic State. The idea being that everyone, all of us, are going to rush off and buy golden dinars and go buy to the dollar. It's fantasy. And they're trying to support the fantasy idea of a state, even in Dabiq, their official you know, magazine. Uh, where the letter, there's a letters page, by the way, which always at the end says, uh, we ask readers to be brief because our letter editors are very busy. Um, but no, I think you're quite right. Look, the idea of an Islamic state intrinsically doesn't work. Islam or the state, which you're talking about. But at the same time, what you cannot get rid of is the fact that this institution called ISIS, however fantasy like it may be, exists, it's real, it's there. And how does it exist? If you take the R. Fisk version of reality, it's a weapon. It is not an Islamic state, it was never intended to be. It's a weapon. Then you've got to work out who uses the weapon, why is it supplied, who knows it's a weapon. And I've tried to go down that avenue. Of course we know that the, all the great ideological movements of Europe have always been separation or otherwise of church and state, French Revolution, etc. Um, and I know someone who's working very hard on this for a radio program at the moment who's going to enormous lengths to go right back to the caliphates to discover you know, the difference between the possibility of a secular institution alongside Islam, if you like. Uh, no, I think the professor at Imra, I didn't pick up his, his name, I'm sorry, but I think he's got it right. Uh, but I don't think it's a, a terrible... I don't think it's a terribly uh, original idea. I mean, all along the problem, I mean, look at the Muslim Brotherhood. They, they couldn't set up any kind of Muslim state in Egypt when they tried. It failed. And of course, Mr. Al-Sisi assisted in that failure because he was Minister of Defence, wasn't he, at the time? Um, thank you for a wonderful tour de force, but could I ask you two areas, I hope they don't sound naive questions, because I've studied a lot of these. There things. are no naive questions in the But moment. I want to mention two areas I never hear mentioned at all on our media. Why do the refugees never also flee to, for example, Morocco or other states, other Arab states or Muslim states, where you'd imagine that a tradition of hospitality might be available. I'm just trying to think are there other ones or not, number one. And number two, I loved your idea of exporting, um, I was one of the 10 people who heard of the Nansen passport, but I loved your idea, I think it's a great idea, but I loved your idea of exporting education and institutions and all the rest of it. Now, we've had reports in our newspapers recently of palaces being built in Dubai and places like this where, you know, the gold taps for the bath cost 10,000 each, etc. They're spending billions on f a huge amounts of money on frippery and a lot of those Gulf states that residents are, I gather, not only the immigrants, the uh, foreigners, the Europeans. Why does nobody put any pressure on those fabulously wealthy Gulf states to at least fund some decent uh, services for these, their own people as refugees, wherever they are refugees even, but just to fund that. I hear nothing about that and nothing about them going, some of them at least, to okay. a country like Morocco. I I'll answer your question chronologically. Number one, if you were a refugee, would you go to Saudi Arabia? I mean, the point is that, that the Muslim refugees of the Middle East have realized that these states are basically fraudulent. 
I, Morocco, fine. I mean, I'm talking about all the cities. I'm sorry, I'm not uh, um, our, our, our friend the king, as, as he's called in Paris. I, I don't think Morocco is any less fraudulent than any of the other states of the Maghreb, or indeed of the Arab world. The problem is, these states are intrinsically fantasy states, particularly Dubai, of course. I'd have to say, by the way, that in the Emirates, of which Dubai is a part, in Abu Dhabi, they are pouring billions, billions, into education universities, bringing in Harvard colleges, I have to say that their treatment of their expatriate workers is outrageous. I did a big series on them also in Dubai. But they are in Abu Dhabi genuinely trying to produce an educated population for the post-oil era. So it, you mentioned Dubai, which is an outrageous and obscene place. <clears throat> Look, um, I don't think that the Arab world cares about the refugees any more than they care about the Palestinian refugees. If they're going to help the Syrians in Lebanon, why have we had 300,000 Palestinian refugees living in filth ever since 1948? Uh, uh, in Syria, it was a little bit easier. The Palestinians could have Syrian nationality, in Jordan, no, and so on and so forth. Um, why, why is it that with their enormous oil wealth, the Saudis can't do more for the, for, for the Palestinians inside the West Bank and Gaza, for example? Well, they don't, I think, want to. Uh, you know, I've come more and more to feel that the Arab Muslim states are fraudulent. They do not qualify as nation states in the sense, I mean, I'll make an exception for Lebanon because I love living there. But even there, <laughs> there are major problems and you've got to look at the Palestinians. But, you know, I was very struck by the fact that when the million refugees started pouring into Europe, what did the Saudis say? They offered tents for them in Germany, sent them where they wanted them to go, you see. Mm. We have a question here. Yeah, sure. There's a mic with the person. Yes, he has a yeah. mic. Right, yeah, go, please. Yeah, uh, that was an incredible talk. Um, I was just uh, could you stand up? Yep, please. Um, you're famous for your uh, pessimistic outlook on uh, the Syrian opposition. Pessimistic? Uh, on uh, yeah. the anti-Assad opposition. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, um, shortly after the February ceasefire in the mm -hmm. town of Aleppo, there was a protest Mm -hmm. where uh, people uh, shouted, uh, curse you, Golani, uh, bearded mm -hmm. man hijacked our and revolution. And showed the green, white, and black flag again. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and in, uh, As they did in Duma. Two yeah, Damascus, and, yeah, and in uh, the town of uh, Murat al-Numan, mm -hmm. I think, uh, al 33, yes. mm -hmm. yeah, uh, to the south of Idlib, um, uh, they said uh, one, 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 the Syrian people are one. Um, do you feel at all hopeful uh, about these developments? Um, well, I'd like to feel hopeful, but there's a wall that we sometimes hit as journalists called reality. Um, when you hear David Cameron, my own beloved Prime Minister, referring to the 70,000 moderate ground troops in Syria, we're back in the world of fantasy again. Um, you know, if you go back, I'm still trying to learn what happened to the secular opposition and how the arms took over, the, the armed men took over. There were armed men, as you know, on the streets of Dara and indeed in northern Syria, oh, actually right next to the northern Lebanese border in May of 2011. It started quite early. I've yet to learn how, whether it was through the intimidation of Nusra, first of all, and then later of ISIS, whether it was the bad advice of Western nations which caused the sinking of the secular unarmed opposition which we're talking about the people who were being shot down by the Syrian army in the streets of Dara and Homs and uh, Damascus, for that matter, and in Aleppo later on. Um, you know, my colleague Patrick Coburn, for example, not long ago found a, a joint checkpoint of Syrian military, Syrian government army, and Free Syrian Army together. And I know several Free Syrian Army people who've just come back and gone home. You know, it's over, you see. Um, which, of course, is in Assad's interest. He wants ISIS there. He wants... And, and, of course, it's quite deliberate. The Americans did not bomb ISIS. When ISIS took Palmyra, there were massive 100-mile-long convoys coming across the desert. The Americans didn't bomb them. When the Syrians and the Russian Air Force drove ISIS out, the Americans said, we bombed them twice, you see. So who are the Americans fighting for? These are the questions I can't answer because I can't cross that line. You know, I've had several people about three years ago, or two years ago, saying, come and come to Aleppo. I said, I'm sorry, you can't look after me. Al Jazeera reporter went with Nusra, to report in, in the Islamist opposition area and was dragged out of a car by uh, ISIS and executed. So I can't go there to answer your question. But the answer is also uh, an event that took place very early on in the revolution when the French and American ambassadors advised the opposition in Homs not to talk to Assad. 
And the reason they gave is, he's going. We're coming back in six weeks, he won't be here anymore. You don't need to. That might have been a very critical mistake, uh, said through self-importance or over-exaggeration or stupidity, whatever. But I think the opposition took that advice. That might have been a moment when Assad was on his heels to actually go in. But let me just add something on the question of Syria. Um, I don't think that Assad is going to decide the future of Syria, and I don't think the opposition is. I've spent months and months and months over the past years since the war began with the Syrian government army. They were the corrupt occupying army of Lebanon, remember, until 2005. But they're not the same army anymore. They're an army that is ruthless, loves fighting, and feels it has something to fight for. And with Russian weapons, new Russian weapons, they're able to start breaking ISIS, and nobody else has been able to do that. I think that the future of Syria may well ultimately be decided by the Syrian army, not by the Ba'ath Party and not by the opposition. This is just a Fisk theory, which I feel more and more strongly is correct, but I can't prove it, and I may be wrong. That's the best answer I can give. at the very back. Uh, I just, you mentioned about uh, the need for new institutions, but we already have an institution called... Well, the United the, Nations, I know. Exactly. Now, if, if I could just make a, a quick point about the abject failure of the United Nations. Uh, for example, in 2011, there was one trillion spent on military weapons. 60% of that was spent by the five permanent Security Council members, of which 40% was spent by the United States. Now, my point is that everyone here tonight cares about Syria in one way or another, but we're helpless and powerless. But one way where we have power is this, that if we demand to everyone here tonight sends a message to everyone they know that the democratization of the United Nations Security Council is the most gravely important matter in the world after climate change. At the moment, we have an organization which has changed very little from World War I, the major powers, yeah. World War II, okay. the, the same reply? structure. Can I reply? Yeah, to sure, yeah. Because other people want to ask questions. Look, I agree with you about the poor old UN. We loathe it, we hate it, we despise it. My dad loathed it. But whenever we suddenly have a ceasefire, we invite the UN donkey to come clip-clopping <coughs> in to save us. I remember once in the Croatian-Serb war in the Balkans, actually in Bosnia, being with a Canadian unit and sheltering with a with them in a ditch with shells, Serbian shells fell around us. And I started blitzing on about the UN and how useless it was. He had, of course, a blue berry on or a blue helmet at that point. And he said, you know, Robert, if we'd had a UN in the First World War, we might not have had a Battle of the Somme. And I was left in rather dangerous circumstances to reflect upon this interesting thought. Um, the UN is the sum of its parts. It is not a committee of wise men. I go to the UN sometimes and go through this um, rigmarole of listening to... You know, the funny thing about the UN, it happened particularly in Bosnia, their, their commitment to neutrality and peacekeeping and not naming the guilty parties is a religion. I, I often said that in Bosnia you had three religions. You had the Christians, the Muslims, and the UN. The UN has become such a religion now that it's unreformable. You even find that when you go to Nakura in southern Lebanon and talk to UN officials, or I do the same anywhere else in the Middle East, it's like their voice lowers in a prayer-like quaver as they begin to tell me of the morality of peacekeeping and of peace enforcement and of making sure that you don't blame anybody for doing anything wrong. That was a problem in Bosnia for obvious reasons because we all know who the major victims were. I don't know how you reform the UN. It is a creature of the Second World War. That's why the Security Council is what it is, as the League of Nations was a creature of the First World War. Maybe we need a new United Nations with a different name. But presentation is what people like Blair and Bush have always loved, isn't it? You know, change the name, it'll be okay. I don't know how to answer your question other than that. We need to look a little bit beyond perhaps the United Nations. That's why I brought up, for example, the Nansen passport, because the UN has not come up with anything like that. Sorry, I've lost my question there. Sure. Yes. Yeah, uh, please ask your yeah. question. Um, I, I would like to um, thank you for exposing uh, violence closer to home and that the 1916 proclamation. <coughs> and uh, you exposed it on the Reese Norty um, documentary. All violence is evil, Jesus said, those who draw the sword, all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Mm. But in this country, we're honoring evil 500 deaths. It's, it's hypocrisy, you know. And about justice, eye for eye, it's not Jesus says, before it was said, eye for eye, but I say to you, offer the wicked man no resistance, turn the other cheek. 
the, the way to overcome all this evil is conquer it with good, as St. Paul said in Romans. And the last question I give you is, Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me. So are you with me or are you against me? Forgive me, I'm getting an echo here that you can't hear. Are you with me or against me? Yeah, I'm getting an echo here that you can't hear. Okay. Can you just make the question slightly shorter? Okay, so, Nin- it's slower, so I can hear. 1916 violence. Yes, yes, yes. Of yeah. Course. People here are honouring it. I'm, yes. I'm thanking you for exposing it. It was um, blasphemy using God's name in, in the name of violence. And uh, the I've president up there as well is, is, is honouring it. And that's an evil. I so, think we got the point. We just wanted your question. Uh, uh, so is, uh, the question. I, I have okay. never used these words. Jesus are you said, to me are you, "Jesus said, you're either with me or against okay. me." That's Sorry, the question. Okay. So I'm asking, are you with him? Are you with him? Are you against him? Okay. That's the question. Okay. Look, let you me know, just there's no compromise. You simply, you're non violent and you're God alone. This will alone. not answer your or question, your, but nonetheless, you might. When Michael Portillo did his program the other day, the British version of 1916 and what the Brits did. I made a brief appearance in it, but the, the one thing he cut out very quickly was when he said at the end of the programme to me, was 1916 the most important event in the modern Irish nation? And I said, quick as a flash, no, joining the European Union probably was. <laughs> and amazingly, it disappeared from the British narrative that Michael Portillo put out, even though the two things actually hang together because that was Ireland's re-entry, formally, finally, into the European nation. Which, of course, 1916 prefigured. Question here. A quieter question. Hello. Go on, it's all right. I'll, Shout. I'll be brief. Uh, should the United States continue to support militarily the Kurds? Military? Uh, militarily the Kurds in northern Syria. Uh, should the United States The United States should them? not support anything military in the Middle East. Nor should anyone else. Enough. You know? Are you finished with that question? Yeah. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm in the School of Politics, so it's the second time I see you today. But I didn't get You don't the have to apologise. It's all right. Um, <laughs> I didn't get the chance to answer you this particular question because, uh, I've, as we've seen in the last few months, we've seen of quite a damaging, potential, potentially very damaging agreement between the EU and Turkey. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be very diplomatic about potentially. it. Potentially! Um, but one of my concerns is that there's going to be a redirection of, of, of people on the move through Libya. Yes, it's already started. It's already started. Um, yes, and uh, there was already human rights violations of people in Libya prior to the Arab uprisings and the Libyan civil, civil war, which were well documented. So how do you see... I have two parts Look, to my question. How this do you is, see the future this, of Libya? This is part of our Western arrogance. We thought, oh, we'll do a patch up in Turkey and they'll not come any other way. Of course they came another way. They're going to come through Libya to Italy and if necessary, they'll make their way into the Maghreb and come to Spain or go to Malta again. I mean, the idea that this mass of the huddled masses are suddenly going to say, oh, well, that's a right cop there. They got us on the Turkey thing. Three billion dollar bribe. We'll give up. They're not going to give up. They're still going to come. But I mean, I've made the point in my own paper paper in quotes, because of course now it's a website, but I made the point that, look, you know, what are we doing doing this $3 billion deal with Turkey, apart from the fact they're all going to get nice visas if they want to come to Europe? This is a country that still continues to repress and kill the Kurds. It's a country that still fails totally to acknowledge the Armenian genocide of 1915. It's a country that locks up its journalists for opposing its president, and we're doing financial deals to send refugees to them? That's all you need to ask. And I, I know that the European Union is a wonderful institution, and it's lovely and it's nice and we all support it, but really, you know, if you want to know what will destroy the EU, that kind of deal with will. How about Libya? What, Poor what old Libya. Well, Libya, you know, at least the UN is, UN again, the UN is involved in Libya, and at the moment there's a kind of ceasefire, but, you know, Libya is one of those countries that never was a country. It was Tripolitania, wasn't it, you see? I, I was always, I'm always struck by a biography I read some years ago of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, who, of course, was an Ottoman soldier. And he was sent to uh, Tripolitania, Libya today, to train the tribes of how to fight the Italian colonizers. Later, of course, Mussolini's Italians, but not them. And he wrote a letter to a fellow lieutenant in Bosnia, which was also part of the Ottoman Empire, saying, you know, it's very interesting training the Libyan tribes. They're very good fighters but they want the war to go on forever, so we'll pay them more and more money. <laughs> and I thought Ataturk probably got it right. Not a great, not, not a great hero of mine, but there you go. Um, no, look, I don't know what will happen to Libya. I've been there many times, but I, I simply don't, don't know the answer, it. and I hate journalists who claim they know the answer to things they don't understand. 
Uh, this question here. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Robert, for a very interesting talk. Um, I, I have to say, though, I'm, I always feel very uncomfortable when the word we is used. When uh, the word which is used? We, that these things are done by us. Oh, we, West. sorry. <laughs> I, I, I tried feel, to get out of that at the beginning. Yeah. I, I, I feel very uncomfortable with yeah, that. Yeah, so do I. But I know why you do it and so on. But uh, could, I, could I ask this question? Um, given the uh, history of the Middle East, right, going right the way back to the Crusades, is it realistic to expect, or is it not a contradiction in terms to expect imperialism which is what we're dealing with here on, on a massive scale, a, a reinvigorated imperialism. Is it not a contradiction in terms to expect imperialism to bring education and justice to the Middle East? Well, first of all, the biggest imperial power in the Middle East was the Ottoman Empire, which of course was Turkish and Muslim, or Turkish run and Muslim. Um, look, it depends how long you're going to believe in imperialism as representing us. You, you know my feelings about we. I'm using we like, um, you know, we the West. I'm not using it about a particular country, Switzerland, Britain. Well, I do include Britain, actually, but not Ireland particularly. But th the problem here is this. We can continue, we, here we go again, can continue on the path of what you call imperialism and show our strength and our power over various groups who we think are evil, wicked, um, uh, apocalyptic, you name it. And there is an element, and there was an element during the American invasion of Iraq in 2003 when I began to realize what imperialism meant. It didn't necessarily mean that you controlled the people. They couldn't do that. It meant that you showed power. Imperialism is about the demonstration of power. We can go to Baghdad, so we will go to Baghdad. We can drive our tanks and fly our helicopters over the ancient land of Samara, so we will, and show the world. It was a demonstration of power that imperial powers need to continue to exist and breathe. You can, you, you can demonstrate this in the Philippines 100 years ago, you can demonstrate it in Vietnam, or you can demonstrate it in Iraq. You can choose which is the least inimical to your imperial ambitions. But that is the problem. But at the end of the day, empires are brought low by policies that don't work. Uh, we could go into the Roman Empire, which just broke apart, not because the Goths, Visigoths, and Ostrogoths invaded, but because the center of Rome disintegrated. It no longer had a center. People didn't believe they belonged to Rome anymore. Going back to my conversation with the CIA again, Kurt, in 2004. So I think that what you've got to think of is an America that is able to think beyond what I suppose I would call the CNN Fox News narrative. You know, this wonderful democratic country that's going to bring good to the world and get out of our way or we'll flatten you like a car park, etc. Uh, and that's not actually the American narrative if you go to the States. I'm always struck and impressed in America by how bright Americans are. What does strike me again, and what is most awful about America, is here you have this massive state, empire if you want to call it, which has universities with departments of Islamic affairs, Middle Eastern affairs, Hebrew affairs, Judaic affairs, everything from sea to shining sea, funded by billions of dollars. And here is this massive academic brain, which we cannot possibly in Europe hope to put together. And yet, when I turn on which television? Let's say Channel 4 and be nice for a moment. When I turn on television and I watch the State Department spokesman, it is infantile. It bears no relation to the knowledge which America possesses about the rest of the world. That is the interaction that is the problem. Is it about power? Is it because governments are intrinsically dangerous things? When I go to Washington, I see a city founded on power. And power is not necessarily a nice thing. It's what makes government work, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily fair. Now I'm going off the point. There's a question here. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for the talk. Uh, when you see uh, the chaos in the Middle East and maybe also what's happening in American politics, do you think we're living through a period of American decline? We should stop after this one. Yeah. Um, one more. Uh, not yet. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just one lady. Okay. One, one more. Okay.
Uh, yes, one final question. I'm very, very sorry. There's so many people who would like to ask questions, but unfortunately, uh, it's just not possible. Uh, so one final question from the back. Robert, first of all, thank you very much for your talk. And I just have one observation to make. A lot of the, con the conversation here this evening has been looking at the Middle East with a reactionary or antagonistic perspective. And in 2009, I was member of the EU delegation that worked on the trade enhancement program in Syria. I don't think if many people in the room are aware of this. It was a 15 million euro trade enhancement program. We worked with all the departments under the Assad regime. They cooperated with us and we were exploring opportunities for trade within the European Union. So much so that I'm aware that a lot of olive oil from Italy is mixed with Syrian and is exported through the European Union okay, as, as Italian olive oil. That's only a small aside, but I'm, I'm just interested in the perceptions, okay, um, obviously post the, um, the revolution, but in 2009, there was an extremely good relationship with the European Union leaders. All members of the European Union states were represented, myself included, as part of this trade enhancement program. And we were exploring many, many sectors of trade enhancement mm -hmm. and cooperation with Syria. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, um, in your, the context of giving institutions, okay, within Middle Eastern countries mm. and s sponsored by EU or states or organizations, do you think there is a way forward in a trade or a cooperation perspective rather than an antagonistic or military? The problem is that the biggest trade is in weapons. That's the problem. I, I, there's no problems in having trade in paint, ships, railway locomotives, uh, and exports and imports. But the problem is the biggest trade is in weapons. And in that sense, trade is contaminated from the start. Look, I think, I, I don't mean to overquote, I don't mean to overquote a well-known Irish poet and talk about everything has changed. But if you want an example of how everything has changed, and I will here point a finger of blame at myself, look how it is that in the last hour and a half, we have discussed just about everything, and you've asked about everything, but I have not once mentioned, nor have you, the word Palestine, and they are the victims of what is happening now too. And we didn't even mention it once. <laughs>